So let's get started. Welcome to Innovating and Transforming Business Through Human-Centered Design Thinking. We will just cover the fundamentals for today. We may schedule uh, a part two for deeper understanding and to continue the learning session. I have just turned off the video for now so we can focus on the slides. This is referenced from a three-day face-to-face short course blended with mobile-based interactive learning application that uh, Dick and I took at Singapore Management University, SMU, last September 2018. The course was entitled Innovating Through Design Thinking. And this was done by Jean Kang Moller, who is a vice president for group customer experience of OCBC Bank, one of the top banks here in Singapore. She is SMU faculty, design strategist, and practitioner. As much as I want to share with you the packed three days that we had and other learnings we had during our applications and our interactive mobile learning, it's impossible. So we'll just have to go through some of the fundamental concepts today because we only have an hour for this session. In terms of objectives, by the end of one hour, I aim to share the definition process concepts of the of foundational understanding for human-centered design. And I will also share key methods and design principles, particularly customer journey mapping. We won't have time to go into detail, um, detail of customer journey mapping, and we won't have time to go into prototyping and MVP. And this is something that I'd like to share more into a part two that we can organize. What comes to your mind when we say human-centered design? Is that something that uh, you've come across with? Can I just uh, see some answers, perhaps in the chat box or in the whiteboard? I'll just clear all. Okay. So you can use the text. I think it's easier you type in the text. So when we say human-centered design, what comes to your mind? Can you share either in the chat box or type it on the whiteboard? So Benji said this is his first time to hear it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Benji, for writing it something new. From Orly, anything that appeals to human senses and sensibilities. I can't see any other answers at this time, so I guess it's really something new to most of you most of us in fact even for for dick and i before attending the course it was something new penny just said i attend the design thinking already from ateneo okay from trina i'm not sure but from the term possibly design taking into consideration people's attitude personality and behavior and you're right okay i think um and what orly said as well that uh, appeals to human senses and sensibilities. Very close to the definition that we have here. Let me share our definition of human-centered design thinking. There are two key phrases or words here, human-centered and design. Human-centered is a process that starts with the people you are designing for and ends with new solutions that are tailor-made to suit their needs. Keywords being, it starts with the people, ends with new solutions, and the word needs, okay, highlighted in yellow. The other keyword here is design. Design is a word that is both a noun and a verb. So as a noun, it is a look and feel of a final object. As a verb, 
it's the process of originating and developing a new object. So it can be a noun or, or a verb. Hence, it is both the process and the result. We can also say that the quality of the process is directly related to the quality of the design outcome. Let me share more about design. What do we mean by design? And here is a definition from agency. Agency is a design company whose mission is enabling the capacity to act by design. They said design is a vehicle to innovation. And what do they mean by that? So it progresses from no conscious design, which means design value isn't recognized. Design as styling, where, where design is a gateway to being cool and trendy. Design as function and form, where the design makes things work better. So there is incremental innovation. Design is a problem solving where design finds new opportunities by solving existing problems, evolutionary innovation lives here. And finally, design as a framing strategy, where design redefines the challenges facing the organization. And here, disruptive innovation lives. So in summary, design can be a vehicle to innovation. Now let's look at the other keyword earlier, human-centered. Human-centered, which we defined earlier, is the process that starts with people that you are designing for and ends with new solutions that are tailor-made to suit their needs can be defined in terms of a process. Okay. I am sharing this with you as a process that we will look, look into, that we will use from begin from now up to the end of this uh, session. So the process may look like this. It starts with people. Then from there, we experiment and learn. From, and then you know, from, the, from what we learn from the people. And then we implement. You might say this is common sense, yes, but it's not commonly practiced. On a side note, the whole human-centered design thinking and process became popular um, when IDEO, 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 a company um, in design, a global design company, made it popular in the 90s, starting in the 90s up to today. Their mission is to create positive impact through design. And uh, you will find, see later, hopefully, as we progress in the presentation, why it's become popular. There are certainly many uses and benefits to it. So this process, using the diamond, a big diamond that goes, uh, goes smaller over time, has a reason for it, why it's represented that way. Why diamonds? Because it represents the process. Okay, it actually um, starts with the diverge and then it converges. And then in the process, when we experiment and learn, we test and iterate and then we implement. I will talk in more detail about this diverge and converge. And as you can see, this is the biggest diamond. This is the biggest part of it. We'll, in the process, we spend a lot of time in this um, beginning, pro the, the, the first process, the starting with the people diverge and converge. So what do we mean by this? Divergent thinking is when we create choices. We start with the needs of the people that we're designing for. We explore with them and we get their permission to explore with them. And we 
have an open mind towards many and new options. Convergent thinking is when we make choices out of all those options that we have made, when we apply rigor, test our assumptions, and carefully measure the learnings. So as we progress, we will show you how divergent and convergent thinking is used. In fact, that's only two, these are only two of the concepts that we will be using in HCD. So when we say HCD, we refer to human-centered design because it's, it's a bit long. So the acronym that we've been using is HCD. There are other concepts that we will use and we'll be hearing throughout this, the, this presentation or if we're studying system, uh, sorry, design thinking or design uh, human-centered design uh, thinking. Some of these concepts are written on the slide. Have you heard of any of these concepts? So can I uh, switch again to whiteboard and just ask if there is any that you have heard, read, or come across? from those concepts. So we had empathy, structured ideation, people's story, reframe, visual design, MVP or minimum viable product, change management, journey mapping, crafting insight, jobs to be done, storytelling, prototyping, test iteration, how might we So June mentioned storytelling, Benji, empathy, change management, prototyping, journey mapping for Orly. Who wrote empathy? Was that Orly? Orly, That's Orly. Orly as well. Paulette, you've heard of prototyping, storytelling, and change management. That's good that you have understanding or have come across or probably even used some of the concepts that you have um that we have shown here you know that you have used them probably in your uh, businesses uh in your probably even in school for penny or in your interactions with customers So the human-centered design matters more than ever because we live today in the digital and VUCA world. Through human-centered design, we can focus on the people. We can have the tools and the mindset needed to navigate the uncertain environment. And the good news it is it is learnable. So you might ask, what is the overlap? between human-centered design and innovation. Why is human-centered design a vehicle to innovation or something that is being used for innovation? The overlap is a source of inspiration and the mindset. It's all about the people. It starts with the people. And when there is innovation, of course, it can lead to business transformation. Let me ask you if you've heard of the little black dress. Can you raise your hand or can you say yes or no if you've heard of the little black dress by Coco Chanel, the LBD? Hopefully, the ladies will say yes. <laughs> June, Orly, and Benji said no. <laughs> Something everyone must have from Trina, she said. From Paulette, yes, I think. Haha, I think so, yes. Hmm. 
the little black dress is actually innovative. And you might say, what is so innovative about this? A little black dress by Coco Chanel. It was introduced in 1926. During that time, for many centuries, black clothes were associated with mourning or mystery and piety. In 1926, all that changed when Coco Chanel used the color in fashion and the little black dress was born. Chanel created a garment that was meant to be elegant, but wearable, neutral in color, long-lasting and versatile. So Chanel redefined elegance. Yes, and this is Audrey Hepburn, actually. She made it even more popular in her movie, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And Chanel, you might say, found a source of innovation in simplicity. Up to now, it's one of the most popular, if not the most popular, fashion choice. So this is an example of innovation that actually came from the source of inspiration, which is women. You know, so really understanding what women want. Another quote that would reinforce this would be from Peter Drucker. Um, in 1985, HBR, The Discipline of Innovation, he said, successful innovators use both the right and left sides of brains. They work out analytically what the innovation has to be to satisfy an opportunity. Then they go out and look at potential, potential users to study their expectation, their values, and their needs. We'll now go through some of the foundational concepts, methods, or tools, all those terms that we saw earlier to help us better understand the process, the human-centered design process. As we said earlier, we start with people. And when we start with people, we must understand people. In this context, in our context, in training and coaching, in our day-to-day, -day, that would mean our customers. To understand our customers, we must walk in their shoes. So we must go for a walk with them. And that is what we call empathy. Putting ourselves in the shoes of someone, understanding what they're feeling, seeing the world from their eyes. I won't spend a lot of time on empathy since I believe many, if not all of us, have good foundational understanding about this. It is something that we've also been teaching in our emotional intelligence modules, you know, in our leadership programs. But bear in mind that this is a foundational concept in human-centered design process. I will now switch uh, to our pre-works. Um, hopefully, all made their pre-works. And Trina, uh, thank you in advance. You did a good job in collating all the drawings that we've asked everyone to make. Okay, so we'll switch to another file. Let me just uh, see that. Um, Sorry, uh, I think I have to close this first. I have to close my... I will unmute everyone so I can hear your voice. You, we, you can hear everyone. I will show everyone's work. The work, the pre-work is design a vase and design a new way to enjoy flowers at home. So the first image that you see here was from Benji. The image on the left, I believe, is the, the first one, which is design a vase. The second one is design a new way to enjoy flowers at home. Benji, can you tell more about your image, your drawings?
Benji. Okay, perhaps Benji is on mute. I'll move on to Paulette. Paulette, can you say more or explain more about your vase and your new way to enjoy flowers at home? Please unmute. I've unmuted all of you. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. <laughs> Actually, uh, the typical vase is what I'm, I'm accustomed to see on a day-to-day -day basis. But I would prefer that my flowers would stand alone and I can see them anytime I want. Uh, and they are nicely organized in a canvas perhaps or in a poster. So this one is, did you say hanging? Yeah, <laughs> hanging. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, it's like a vertical garden, but just the frame size, the canvas. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll move on to the next one, June. Can you share more about your vase on the left and on your image on the right? Uh, can you hear me, Elaine? Yes. Okay. Uh, the one on the left is, uh, I, 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 I couldn't think of how to draw it, but the the, the vase is actually uh, you can use either side. So there's a cork, there's a hole on, on both sides. You can actually put a cork underneath one side if you want to use the other side as the where, where you put the, the flowers, no? Or whatever ornament. And then you can reverse it if you want to use the other side, depending on, on uh, which side appeals to you more. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually a it's a double-sided vase. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the way that it's designed is also the way that the my image on the right, which is the flowers, uh, might be used uh, in combination with that vase, which means that depending on how you might use the vase, the, the cork might be replaced by something that is uh, much more durable versus water. Why, why do I say that? Because the one on the right uh, is actually hydrophonic, hydrophonic uh, grown flowers that are inside the house, close to a sliding door, which is sunlit. So which means uh, right now the flowers that we have are all outside in the garden or in, the, in a vase that is in the middle of the dining table. But one way to enjoy it is to have more hydrophonics uh, flowers that are not dependent on soil, but it can be inside. So you can use the vase and then a different type of, uh, of flowers. Mm -hmm. So this is um, designing the flowers according to how your home is set right. up well. Yep. Yes. Yeah, and we can have more of it indoor without mm -hmm. rely, relying on traditional uh, pots and soil. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you, June. I'm moving on to Trina. Okay, Trina, can you share more about your vase on the left oh, and your image yes. on the right? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, first I drew, uh, it's actually a glass vase. So usually it can be used so you can put uh, not just flowers, but like the big, uh, like, you know, plants. I don't know, I don't know what you call it, like parang stalks, the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, wherein you can also put jellies and stuff like that. And then the one on the right, it's actually a table. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen one of these wherein it's a glass table wherein you can see preserved flowers inside. And you can also mix it with, um, like, for example, coffee beans, but for some, like, uh, the colorful, uh, what do you call that? Like jellies or balls, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's in the table, inside the table, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Dried flowers with coffee beans, jellies, and others that may mix with the dried flowers. Thank you very much, Trina. Is this something existing in your home now? It's not a table. <laughs> it's more <laughs> of a decoration. Okay. And in lastly, some of the coffee shops now I see it, yeah. 
you see it okay i have orly's drawings here on the left and on the right orly can you please uh, share more about this Okay, um, maybe Orly is on mute. I could see here the vase, which has very nice flowers. And on the right side, um, a vase which has fish inside. Okay, with flowers. It's a PVC pipe, according to Orly, transparent. PVC site with holes and did I interpret this right with fish okay so it's right it's transparent with PVC pipe with holes and a small aquarium with fish inside <laughs> so what did you notice about the drawings in general between um the vases that all of you have drawn and the second where the instruction was to design a new way to enjoy flowers at home. And by the way, Orly just said this is something you can put on the center table. Okay. Aquarium and flower vase and flower all in one can i just ask for those who are able to use the audio to see your observation between the two drawings in general based on what you have seen five there were five uh starting from benji's to palettes June's, Trina's, and Orly's. Any observation? Didn't you feel that there was more diversity in the ideas and, and the images that you saw in the second one? I can see June agreeing, new ideas. Orly said coming up with something new that could be both functional and fun. That's right. So in alignment with what we said or read earlier about design, it can be a new function and form. It can be for styling. June also said it's distinct versus most other people's ideas, which is true. Um, the other observation I have was that most of you, if not all of you, related it to your environment, to your home, to your space, to how you live. Paulette said, insightful to see the preferences in aesthetic and functional design. So thank you very much for all those answers and for sharing your designs of the vases and the design of how you would enjoy flowers at home. This is a key concept actually in human-centered design. Let me close this and switch back to our materials. Because now I will show you the concept that we have actually used for this. It's reframing. Reframing is being able to see the problem differently. Reframing is identifying opportunities because we empathize with the users. 
In our pre-works, we refrain by not limiting to the design of a vase that holds flowers or plants, rather by opening, opening up to different ways that you, the participants, perhaps in your home or in your workplace or whatever space that you enjoy, where you enjoy flowers. Through reframing, we got a variety of creative concepts and ideas. Through reframing, we generated different and really interesting outcomes. We'll now go into the other concept, a big one, insights. But to understand insights, let me ask you the difference, what you understand is the difference between data and insights. You are unmuted, actually, so anybody can just unmute and speak up. From my end, I've unmuted everyone. So if you can just unmute and share what you understand the, between the difference between data and insight. Or perhaps type it up. So Trina mentioned data as info and, in fact, and facts. And insights would be interpretations and observation. That is right. Data can be hard, uncontestable, and empirical from June, while insights are more person-centric and influenced by experience, culture, and mindset. Data is a source. An insight is an outcome of a process that data is subjected to, according to Paulette. And from Benji, insights are ideas and new learning. And all of you are correct. Thank you for sharing that. What we're saying in this uh, session is that data is an observation. It's a finding. Some of you have said the same thing. Insight is the why. It is the discovery of something enlightening about customer needs and motivation that drives value and competitive advantage. So keyword here is it's the why. Okay. And we will keep on going back to the insights. Insights, it's not what people is telling us, but how people are really behaving. It is a re revelation. It is a gut felt response that makes us sit up and think. And it communicates the deepest customers' needs, sometimes without them even knowing this. Importantly, we have to learn how to craft insights in human-centered design process. And what will help us will be applying the divergent and convergent thinking. How? By starting with people's stories. How? By having conversations, grabbing quotes, observ observing clear, very closely and asking questions. This is how we will craft insights and start with people through the people stories. How do we start with the people stories? So we said conversations, quotes, observations, ask, asking questions. What kind of questions should we ask? Okay, actually, I was supposed to uh, call Benji. <laughs> Benji, um, unfortunately, his audio is not working. Okay. I want to ask Benji if he can just share something that he has purchased recently. Um, Benji, has your is your audio now working? Still not, uh. Okay. So can I ask uh, either Orly or June? Orly's earlier uh, was also muted. Perhaps June, if it's okay to 
ask you this question. What have you purchased recently? Oh, big or small? Me? Yes, big or small item in the last, say, six months or so. Okay, well, in the last 48 hours, I bought uh, uh, a book. A book. Uh, yeah, uh, a fictional novel uh, about a fictional character, but drawn out of uh, some historical fiction, historical uh, events in Rome. So it's a novel of Spartacus. It's a book. Okay. What the title is? Uh, the Risen. The recent. When did you first yeah. think of this purchase, June? Uh, well, as soon, as soon as I saw it in the bookshelf and I was attracted to the cover. So it wasn't a premeditated purchase. I was browsing <laughs> around and then I saw the book okay. and uh, I was drawn to it. What was happening during that time? Well, uh, because I was in the bookstore, so I was uh, contemplating on uh, finding a book that uh, that interests my that is interesting to me in terms of the themes that I am particularly drawn to. And I saw the cover, and because it talked about history of Rome, and then uh, I was I was just at the point where I normally am, which is wanting to expand my and broaden my, my knowledge, at the same time fueling my passion for history. So the cover which showed a Roman gladiator attracted me. So I was, I was at the, I saw the book at the time I was wanting to expand my, you know, my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Who who helped you make uh, that purchase? Did anyone uh, help or no no well okay. yes indirectly because mm -hmm. there was at the front cover of the book there is a uh, there is a endorsement no by George R R Martin and mm -hmm. so I realized that if he endorses this book then it's something that I uh, I would like to pick up and mm -hmm. yeah and how does that purchase make you feel well, uh, very pleased, very excited. I saw the first three pages and I knew that I bought the right book. I couldn't put it down. In fact, it was already past midnight when I started on it. And uh, as for, as I'm in this webinar, I'm actually holding holding the book. <laughs> 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 okay. Multitasking. <laughs> okay. Well, I have, I'm not reading it, but I'm holding it. <laughs> holding next thing to do what was the reaction from louis or your family uh not from louis but from my brother-in-law who himself is uh, a history aficionado and at the same time someone who who really is taken up with the roman empire and all of the germanic tribes during the time and their conquest of most of europe so i was telling him about the purchase just at lunchtime today and he, uh, he seemed to be very excited as well, and uh, he wanted to know more about it, especially the prequel, which I didn't get to buy. So he was telling me, so you just need to go back. You know, after you read this book, then you hope, hopefully you can find the prequel and, and read that back. So the reaction is one of uh, sharing my the excitement and the joy over buying this book. Thank you. So thank you for that impromptu one, uh, June, and for sharing um your purchase and answering those questions and what i've actually asked those five questions that i asked actually answered or uh, talked about your motivation the context your support the emotion and the social aspect of that purchase of a book and that is a kind of these are the kinds of questions that we should ask okay, from our customers so that we can craft insights. What other kinds of, cost of questions should we ask? As we know, we should ask open-ended questions, but also we should ask very specific questions, specific questions that will help us map the journey of that person. Okay, such as, how does your typical day look like? Tell me about when you were doing this. 
or doing that or trying this or thinking about this? How did it happen? What happened next? How did you feel? Why, why did you feel that way? So always stay curious and go deeper. And remember, always think in terms of a journey. A journey which is a step-by-step -step process. And that's why we look at it from the time that before it happened, when it happened, and after it happened. In this case, in the example of June, if I want to go deeper and extend this um, question and answer interview that we were doing, I would ask about what was he what was he doing before he went to the shop, before he went to the bookshop, and then what happened in the bookshop, and then what happened after uh, he left the bookshop. Okay, so the journey, a step-by-step -step process. And that is how we craft insights. We start with having conversation with people. We get quotes verbatim quotes from them. We write them. We usually write them in a human-centered design process. We use a lot of post-it notes so that we can quickly write their quotes. And then we have our notes, of course, our observations. If we're doing this as a team, we could be assigning someone to write the notes, someone to be observing, or all of us actually observing. This will help us dig deeper to uncover reasons for why people behave in certain ways. And then from there, we map the journey. We synthesize by looking at the emerging patterns. And then we craft an insight, a succinct statement or sentence that reveals the why and points to the way forward. And then from there, we can translate into a how might we question. This is the opportunity the opportunity which we would frame to how might we. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. So June can hear me. Benji can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Trina, Trina cannot hear me at the moment. Okay. For Orly, it's a bit soft. But for June, it's loud and clear. Okay. So I hope everyone can hear me except for Trina, but she will try to uh, refresh. From crafting insights, I just want to go into another concept that will help us also understand um, as we go into this journey mapping, the jobs to be done, as we call it, JTBD. I, I don't know if you have heard of the jobs to be done. Um, I think some of you mentioned that you've heard of some of the concepts. Okay, so June said no, and Benji said no. Let me share a quote from Clayton Christensen, who actually made this jobs to be done term popular. He is a Harvard professor and the author of Innovator's Dilemma. And he also made the disruptive innovation concept popular. He said customers don't buy products or brands. They hire solutions that get jobs done. So JTBD, jobs to be done, can help frame questions and create insights. Let me tell you how. And this, this example I will show now will be very popular, <laughs> at least for, for June and I. Uh, Penny, I think, stepped out. Um, yeah, Penny and Ed will not see this, but June, I'm sure you can relate here. The jobs to be done here, in this example, the job to be done 
that the customer that the customers want is capture and store memories. So that used to be fulfilled by Kodak. And now we can hire quote unquote Instagram to do this. So that's the job to be done. What am I showing in this picture? The job to be done. Okay. The job to be done here by newspapers or magazines. What could be the jobs to be done by newspapers or magazines? Customers might say, some or all of this, keep me up to date, give me access to offers and deals, make me look smart, reinforce my worldview, let me hide. I guess particularly for the printed one, provide me with opinions, entertain me, line the cat litter tray for the printed one. And both the printed one can fulfill it, the digital news or magazine can also fulfill it. So whatever you prefer as a customer, you can hire the solution to fulfill the job that you want to be done, depending on what it is. You can hire a printed version or a digital version of the magazine or the newspaper. So that, those are a couple of examples of jobs to be done. So if I were to summarize so far the process in starting with the people and starting particularly with the stories of the people, this is how it might look like. The HCD process so far, we might start, when we want to start with people, we want to start with conversation, and that could be in the form of interview, and preferably face-to-face -face interview, say for 10 to 15 minutes. We move from broad to specifics. So we, just a very simple example, we might in, you know, just introduce ourselves, introduce the purpose of the interview, and then ask them to tell something about themselves, to establish the general profile of the person and then go into specific questions that will reveal the MCSES, motivation, context, support, emotion, and social aspects. Then we go into the more specific questions that will talk about the lifestyle and the needs. And remember, these were tips from Jean Kang Moller, our facilitator. Ask questions that will bring the customer to a journey thinking, a step-by-step -step process in relation to the objective or purpose of the interview. So if it is about a particular need in training or a particular need um, to buy something, to hire something, how do they do... How, What's the process like? So ask questions that will help reveal the step-by-step -step thinking of the person. And after the interview, the team should debrief right away. And that's where the team would do the journey mapping. If the journey mapping is done by the team only, then it has to be done right away with the verbatim quotes, the key findings, the jobs to be done, the patterns and themes emerging. And the, this whole process is also part of the synthesizing. This can also be done with the customer, actually, if that is agreed agreement with the customer. And lastly would be the prototyping of the idea and the testing. Okay, so... I will, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can type into the message. But so far, what we've done is cover only this diamond, the start with people. We will go quickly into the customer journey mapping 
and I'll show you a couple of examples, uh, sophisticated examples of a court customer journey mapping. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you an example of the project that we did when we were in SMU. But we can only cover that. We can only do the definition and showing examples. Um, to go deeper, we'll have to have a follow-up session or do something face-to-face, -face, especially in applying the learnings. Customer journey mapping is a visual representation of a likely path that customers go through in experiencing our product or brand from a customer's point of view. So keywords here are that it's visual. Um, in fact, we will have to learn how to draw simple symbols or representations. We will not cover it, this in the drawing or what we call power pictures in this session, uh, but it is something that we have to learn to do and we can surely do it. I'm not good in drawing, but I was able to do it at least during the session that we had in um, SMU uh, because there are some techniques taught to us. So we can actually teach simple drawings that can symbolize um, or represent the customer journey mapping. And the other is that it is an experience. It is a customer experience. And it is from the customer's point of view. So these are the keywords. It is a tool to understand the big picture. And it helps us to identify pain points and opportunities. I mentioned about customer experience. Customer experience is the interaction between customers and our brand and their rational and emotional judgment of how good it was, how good the, that experience was. It is a complex process interwoven with channels and journey. So in this example, you will see a customer going through the journey from awareness to making a decision. And in, the, in that journey, different layers of channels are used, be it social media, print, store, website. From awareness up to making a decision, there are several channels used. Customer journey mapping is about people steps. It's not system steps. It, it's about still the people based on people's stories, people quotes, people's thinking, actions. And remember the five motivation, context, support, emotion, and social. Customer journey map, when we do this, we should stretch our thinking by inquiring further. And we should use it as a means to understand, facilitate, and make a decision. And this goes very detailed and deep to help us get into the pain points and opportunities. The, let me show you an example of a customer journey mapping template. So in this template, you will see here the result on the left side, a place where we can put the customer picture and the profile, the motivation, context needs. And then plot here what happens before, during, and after the interaction with our product or service. And then below are different layers of information, the thoughts, the actions, the emotions, the feelings throughout the whole process and from there synthesize uh, through um, all, all this, come up with the pain points and the delighters. To give you an example of an outcome of a customer journey mapping, I'll show you the project that we had uh, last September. There were two parts to it. Uh, I'll show you one part. And thank you, Paulette, uh, for being our interviewee during that time. Can you see here Paulette's journey in Jollibee training project? Okay, so I don't have the actual picture of Paulette and how we put her profile. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take a picture of that, but I remember 
uh, putting the persona of Paulette as the social innovator based on our interviews with her, interview with her and the quotes that we got from her. So in customer journey mapping, after understanding the profile, we usually put the person's profile and call it a persona. We have a, what we call a persona board. Okay, so the persona board that we came up with for Paulette was she was a social innovator. And we had all this post-it, which were the actual quotes during our almost one hour interview with her. So these were the thoughts um, which were based from verbatim quotes. And then this was her, these were her specific steps or actions that she shared with us. She told us in stories on how the journey was in the big Jollibee training project that she had from the time that they did training analysis to the design development, to the presentation, to the senior leadership implementation and the impact to the customer. And then we also plotted, based again on the stories that she shared, the emotional journeys, the highs and the lows uh, throughout the whole process. Okay, so just a quick overview of the outcome of that customer journey mapping uh, based on the conversation and interview that we had from Paulette. So thank you again, Paulette, for allowing me to share this. This is another example, and this one actually is uh, a pitch to the Singapore Immigration and Checkpoint Authority. So if you see her, see the, this one, uh, that is the profile of uh, a Singaporean married with one kid, and this is her persona, and the process of applying for passport, or renewing for passport, the emotions that she goes through, the thoughts, the actions, and emotions that she has. And then there was uh, also a summary of the pain points and the opportunities um, from all the analysis, synthesizing that was done by uh, the company who did this. So I referenced here, once uh, we share this uh, slide deck, uh, you will see more of this because there are very small text here, but you can actually uh, look into the link here and see the reference. Uh, site, you know, where we got this. But uh, ICA, the Immigration Checkpoint Authority of Singapore, was one of the clients of IDO, uh, which was, I, as I mentioned, one of the one of the top global uh, design companies in the world. And they actually helped in redesigning the whole customer experience uh, in the Singapore Immigration and Checkpoint Authority. And then last example, and this is this one, I'll not even attempt to explain it, but I just thought that I'd show it uh, to show you that a, from a very simple to a very sophisticated customer journey mapping. Okay, this is the Rail Europe experience map where they actually uh, did a customer journey mapping uh, of, ex of customers who use the European Rail. Okay, the train system. Okay, and again, the reference site is here. So, June, Benji, <laughs> and Orly, Paulette, Mini, Penny, and Trina. This is uh, almost the end of the presentation. Can you see any application, relevant application to what we do in training and coaching? That is the question that I have for you. I will switch to a whiteboard just in case you want to type it. Or you can just uh, use the chat group or unmute yourself and share by, by saying out loud.
So from Benji, I was thinking how HCD could be applied to make the performance management process a more engaging experience for employees. That's very interesting. The question I have here that I wrote, this is my, um, this is me thinking aloud. Can we use this for our training needs analysis, this process? The other thing that I can think of is, can we use it for strategic business planning? From June, if the HCD concept is to be capitalized on, then at the heart of it is the insight we, we get based on placing ourselves in the customer's position and seeking to understand what they're looking for. From Paulette, it's useful to understanding learner needs and designing experiential learning materials. And June mentioned as well that it starts with the customer and understanding them better. Trina, are you able to show the comments? Or can everyone see the comments? Okay, so June can see. That's right, Penny. Actually, um, you mentioned the customer experience and taking out the silo mentality is where we can really use. In fact, our facilitator, uh, Jean Kang Moller, who's the head of customer experience in OCBC Bank, that's how she really leveraged and maximized design thinking, human-centered design thinking, in redesigning many of the processes in the bank um, from the time that the customer would enter the bank to the time the customer would end. They, she also actually was the one who created the Frank. Frank is a credit card, customizing credit card, which addressed the millennials. So they catered to the millennials Frank opened many shops actually in Singapore. Well, not many, but several shops, select shops, shops in Singapore. It became very successful with the millennials where millennials can customize the credit cards, OCBC credit cards, according to their taste and preference of um, how they want to design it uh, visually. Benji also mentioned about employee onboarding and employee exit that could benefit from HCD. Particularly, Paulette mentioned reframing as a tool, in a powerful tool in creating option in a problem-solving or strategic thinking process. That's right. I also like reframing. Do you have any questions at this point? So, th so June uh, said no questions, but it's been very informative. Thank you that you found it informative.
and Benji, interesting that a number of tools mentioned are similar to those used in coaching, except the role of the coach is to help the coach experience the discoveries. Um, yes, there are many of many of the concepts like the empathy, even uh, the reframing storytelling. Some of this actually um, might be familiar for us in the training and coaching. The the one that requires uh, more practice, I believe, in a different way of approaching things would be uh, the interview process because it requires us to think in terms of journey mapping or journey thinking, requires us to uh, map it out in a visual manner and also um, it requires the team uh, a team to really work on this and and the reason i say team because it's uh it's the power of this process lies in working at, on it as a team let me just switch back to my uh presentation and just show you some of the pictures that we have during our training uh, sorry during our short course at smu so this was our group uh, Dick and I uh, were grouped with another person and we actually did our journey, our interviews, our journey mapping, our synthesizing. We used the whole board to synthesize all the information that we gathered, all the, the verbatim comments, uh, the stories, the observations. And we actually did prototyping. Some did, um, because in prototyping, you can use any material, 3D, any, you know, anything. There's no limit. So we can be as imaginative and creative as possible. So we used whatever materials we could uh, get in storytell in prototyping. And this was our class, okay? And this was, of course, us after, after the whole journey. So thank you as well to everyone. Paulette, thank you as well uh, for your comment here. Thank you for sharing inside generation from target customer skin designing products. Um, unfortunately, there's so many things that I could still share. We could come up with a part two which will go deeper into the customer journey mapping and learn some of the symbols that we use to draw and then and go into the third part, which is the prototyping and the minimum viable product. How do we come up with a prototype and the minimum viable product? Which is important for that, ask, for that uh, remember the process where it goes into iteration and testing before we implement to the market. So it's very, very, this prototyping MVP is very important. Finally, I'd like to just uh, end with this final quote from our facilitator and teacher in SMU from Jean Kang Moller. She said, design thinking is about depth, not breath. Ask yourself, is it a true story? Consider this. Do you want to have the average of 300 or the true stories of 10 to 15 persons? And so the answer for us is clear. If we want to use HCD, we believe in it, then it's a true story of 10 to 15 persons that matter. And with that, thank you very much. Um, I'll be sharing the materials, the deck that I've uh, done here, but also Trina will share the webinar um, in the click meeting, the video replay of this. Okay, so unless there's any other thing that we want to do here, I think uh, we will close. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. I can't hear any one of you, but I can see everyone saying good night. Okay. Thank you. And until our next learning session. Good night. Bye. Good night. Okay. Okay. Bye for Bye. now. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Good night. For that video. Yay. Bye, Penny. Bye. <laughs> <See you. laughs> okay. <laughs>